Okay, um, today's talk is about does meat cause cancer? And actually, meat is associated with increased risk of cancer in multiple ways. First, the fat in meat increases insulin resistance. And the best paper for this is the Brownlee, uh, Michael Brownlee, I won the Banting Award in 2004 paper on a unifying theory of diabetes complications. Um, it's a great paper. I think it's the best paper I've written on it, on, on diabetes. So number one, fat causes in insulin resistance, IR for insulin resistance, which increases insulin levels in the blood, trying to compensate for the insulin resistance. The insulin, even though it, the cells are not as sensitive to it as they normally would be, it still remains its mitogen function, meaning that it induces other cells to divide and replicate. Things that speed up cell division, cell replication, um, are often associated with cancer. So hyperinsulinemia is associated with increased risk of cancer. That's number one. Number two, diabetes, which can be induced by a high meat diet on a chronic basis, um, can lead to hyperglycemia. And chronic hyperglycemia is associated with providing more glucose in this context on a continuous basis um, associated with increased risk for cancer. Um, a high meat diet is associated with increased levels of insulin-like growth factor in the blood, ILGF. Sometimes you'll see the one after it, ILGF1, which is associated with accelerated cell growth and replication and is thought to potentially be one of the mechanisms by which a high meat diet increases the risk of cancer. ILGF1 also decreases um, the likelihood of a cell going into apoptosis. Um, it's preferable that a cell goes into apoptosis, programmed cell death, than that it would become cancerous. Because what I'm talking about here is the metabolic theory of cancer. There's two main theories of cancer. There's a genetic theory of cancer, you know, vulnerable predispositions exposed to some form of a toxin and thus inducing cancer. Then the second thing is there's cells simply predisposed to increased risk of cancer by hypoxia. And the classic work on that was done by Otto Warburg. He won a Nobel Prize in about 1930. And the gist of it being normally a cell is part of an organ system, part of the liver, part of the kidney, part of the lung. And it does whatever cells do for that organ. And they work together as a team. And their contacts with adjacent cells tell them not to divide. So these are highly specialized, differentiated cells. The metabolic theory of cancer is that when these cells become hypoxic, for example, they can't get enough oxygen. That drops their ability to produce ATP energy by, you know, about 18-fold. And sometimes these cells will de-differentiate and become more primitive and simplistic, like a bacteria that's simply out for itself trying to grow. And it'll no longer pay attention to the cues, the signals from the adjacent cells. It'll no longer do what it's supposed to do as part of the liver or the lung or the kidney or the pancreas or the breast or the you know, prostate and just become cancerous. It only grows for the sake of itself to replicate and it tries to spread and divide, metastasize. Okay, so things that cause hypoxia are going to increase that risk of a cell becoming cancerous. You know, quite often a cell that's deprived of oxygen, it just dies. Okay, and that's apoptosis when it happens gradually. It's an infarction when it happens suddenly. But these are important concepts because there's lots of uh, things that are associated with increased cancer risk by inducing hypoxia, for example. And then when it goes into anaerobic metabolism, the, the de-differentiated cancer cell now functioning like an anaerobic bacteria, it'll extrude uh, lactic acid from its glucose metabolism. It can metabolize 100 times more glucose than the adjacent cells. And by putting lactic acid around it into the extracellular matrix, it helps to make its generalized area, its extracellular matrix its milieu more acidic, and that favors cancer growth. So things that cause acidosis will have a tendency to be associated with increased cancer risk. Okay, um, and just for example, you know, the purpose of milk is to help a baby cow grow very quickly. Milk will increase insulin-like growth factor, and thus that's also mitogenic. So insulin-like growth factor, it's like insulin. They're both mitogenic. Mitogenic means to increase the likelihood of mitosis, cell division. Okay, uh, number four is meat tends to have higher levels of leucine. Leucine is an amino acid present in higher amounts in meat, and leucine is associated with increased activation of mTOR. mTOR is mammalian target of rapamycin, and mTOR is primarily thought of as a nutrient sensing pathway. It's like a contractor getting ready to build a building. The contractor will not build until he has all the building materials equivalent uh, available. And leucine tends to be the rate limiting step. So when leucine becomes available, mTOR is more likely to activate a cell to divide. mTOR 
Leucine is also associated with increasing insulin-like growth factor, and leucine is present in higher amounts in general in meat. So that's another reason why meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. Number five, animal protein and saturated fat are both associated with an increase in LDL cholesterol. Just about everybody knows that studies any nutrition that saturated fat, the typical meat fat, is associated with increased uh, blood cholesterol levels. I thought it was quite interesting. I learned this from T. Colin Campbell. He's the protein expert, the guy who wrote the China study, that animal protein will also increase LDL cholesterol. And, and you know, why would it do that? And again, I got this idea from T. Colin Campbell and some other reading that it seems like meat induces this hyper um, metabolic phase towards building stuff. Um, it's just sort of a general idea, a loose concept, but it does seem to do that. Um, so that might explain how animal protein would increase LDL cholesterol. If you're going to start cell replication, those replicating cells are going to need more cholesterol. Uh, they're also going to need some other things. They're going to need more iron, for example, and we're going to come to that in just a moment. Okay, number six, for reasons why meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. And by the way, T. Colin Campbell, he's the world's expert on protein. He says that uh, milk in particular, in his opinion, is the number one carcinogen, the most powerful carcinogen in the world. Okay, um, number six, saturated fat stiffens red blood cells. So what that's about is your red blood cell I have a good, in my lecture on atherosclerosis, just recently, I go through all the, the issues of what makes red blood cells more prone to forming atherosclerosis. But they have a plasma cell membrane on their outer surface. And the more higher percentage they have of saturated fat, the more stiff that membrane. Because saturated fats have no double bonds. They tightly interdigitate. And when they tightly interdigitate, they become more solid. You know, saturated fat, in general, solid at room temperature. Um, just like think about a pizza. You get a pizza when it's all hot, it's kind of gooey, but you leave it sitting on the countertop overnight and it becomes all solid. That's in comparison with MUFAs and PUFAs. A MUFA is a monounsaturated fatty acid, especially olive oil is the classic one people think of oleic acid, but then there's PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and those are even have uh, the ability to stay fluid in the refrigerator, for example, uh, more so than most other oils. But anyway, saturated fats, solid at room temperature, they're relatively stiff fats, and when you got a higher percentage of them, like from a high meat diet, the red blood cells become stiffer. Normal red blood cell, let me show you if I can switch my hands here. The capillary is about five microns. Uh, it's about five microns. Red blood cell is about seven microns. It has to deform to get through that capillary. And when its cell membrane is stiff, it's harder for it to get through the capillary. Blood pressure has to go up. When blood pressure goes up, there's more arterial injury at bifurcation sites. And that leads to atherosclerosis. The atherosclerosis narrows the diameter of the arteries feeding the tissue. When the arteries are narrowed by atherosclerosis, they get less oxygen once the atherosclerosis becomes severe, and that will increase the risk of hypoxia and potentially increase the risk of cancer. Okay, now I've got to switch to the next slide here. Okay, number seven reason why meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. Meat changes the bacterial flora. There's basically two types of flora. There is plant flora, and that's in the present. Plants provide lots of fiber, so they get a different type of flora. Meat and processed food pretty much is almost the same in terms of the gut flora that arise from it. Both meat and processed food tend to be very low. There's no fiber in meat, and there's very low fiber typically in processed food. Okay, so meat changes the gut bacteria. The gut bacteria associated with meat are more likely to not help the colonocytes maintain their tight junctions, so you're more likely to have leaky gut. Um, leaky gut means increased permeability of the intestinal barrier, and that's associated with more systemic inflammation because larger things get through that intestinal lining. It's only a single cell thick. The intestinal tract is also called the enteric tract, so the lining cells of the intestinal tract are also called enterocytes. The ones in the colon, site means cell, C-Y-T-E, colonocytes are the lining cells. So anyways, Bigger particles of food stuff and bacteria in the food can get into the blood, and that incites an inflammatory immune response, which causes some systemic inflammation. Systemic inflammation is thought to be associated with increased risk of atherosclerosis. You've heard talk about elevated CRPs, and that's a whole other subject, but one thing I would tell you, there's a nice book on atherosclerosis by Dr. Haverich. He's a cardiac surgeon, and he makes the point that, in his opinion, he thinks the vasovasorum, the outer uh, layer of the arteries, is the main site where atherosclerosis begins. I actually think 
he's wrong overall, but he's right in particular. He's right in the sense that I think it does sometimes start there and it does start there in certain vessels. But the reason I'm mentioning all this is increased systemic inflammation is associated with vasovessorum, you know, also called tunica adventitia, outer layer atherosclerosis of an arterial wall. The problem with getting atherosclerosis in the outer wall, not in the center lumen, is that you can then occlude the vasovessorum and infarct the wall of the artery and that can over time have that plaque grow because you'll get neovascularity into the plaque through angiogenesis and those are fragile vessels sometimes they'll hemorrhage and bleed and you get rapid expansion of a plaque which can occlude a vessel and lead to tissue hypoxia so this is a mechanism by which inflammation can increase tissue hypoxia there's other ways that it could as well through increasing oxidative stress for example but the point i want to make is meat associated with more inflammation associated with more uh, atherosclerosis, thus potentially more hypoxia when the atherosclerosis narrowing stenosis becomes severe. Okay, number nine, the bacteria in the gut now associated with meat have more of an enzyme called glucuronidase. When your body, let me just stand up for this one, when your body wants to get rid of estrogen, what happens is the estrogen goes to the liver. The liver conjugates the estrogen with a glucuronic, a glucuronic acid and it makes it more soluble in the bile. Then it's excreted into the bile the bile goes into your intestinal tract and then you poop it out, okay? That's what normally should happen. But if you have a bacteria down there, let's say that this is a bacteria. That bacteria um, from meat, it has an enzyme called glucuronidase. It'll deconjugate, take the glucuronic acid off the excreted estrogen, and then the estrogen's reabsorbed into the body. So meat eaters will have higher blood levels of estrogen because they can't defecate it out as, as effectively. And by the way, the question arises, why do meat-related gut bacteria do all these bad things? And here's the answer, because we have been around for who knows how many thousands or millions of years, and we've always primarily ate plants. We got a herbivore physiology for our intestinal tract and our metabolic system. And because of that, over all these years, the plant bacteria have become symbiotic with us. That's an important point. Plant bacteria are symbiotic with humans, meaning that they want to live together with us. They help us out, we help them out. Living in our colon is a good apartment for them. So what that means is the plant bacteria benefit from keeping us alive and healthy. Whereas the meat-related gut bacteria, they could care less if we're alive or not. They haven't been with us long enough to have evolved to be favorable to us. They don't give a rat's tail if we are healthy or not, okay? So that's why they'll often do so many pathogenic things. We're designed to live with plant-related gut bacteria in our intestinal tract, and they do a lot of good things for us. The meat-related gut bacteria sort of are on their own, don't really care about us, um, and there's actually a lot of things they do that are harmful to us. Okay, next thing, number 10. The bacteria in the colon associated with a meat diet um, include some that'll feed on carnitine and they'll convert some of that into something called TMA, trimethylamine. And the trimethylamine then goes through the portal vein up to the liver. And once they're in the liver, they get converted to TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. And that's associated with increased risk of atherosclerosis, which can lead to tissue hypoxia. Hypoxia then being a risk factor for cancer. Okay. Um, and one of the researchers who did this work was Stanley Hazen at the Cleveland Clinic. Okay, number 11 reason why meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. Um, the cooking of meat, um, especially when it's cooked at high temperature like grilled meat and like those grill marks, have, tend to have increased amount of something called heterocyclic amines, and those are associated with increased risk of colon cancer. A uh, commonly researched heterocyclic amine is phenylimidazopyridine, okay? Um, Meat, red meat, by the way, has been declared officially, you know, in sort of like the official circles where it takes forever for anything to happen, uh, a carcinogen. Okay, number 12, meat in the colon again. When you have all the meat fat, you need bile salts to, desor to digest fats. So there's more bile salts present in a high fat diet, a high meat diet. And these will accumulate in the colon and they'll get converted into, from primary bile salts to secondary bile salts. And these are carcinogenic. Um, increase the risk of colon cancer. And meat travels slowly through the intestinal tract. The lack of fiber means fiber pulls water into the stool and helps speed it along so you poop it out. Meat sits in our colon longer and gets dried out and it tends to putrefy a bit. And anyways, it's associated with increased risk of colon cancer. There's another chemical that tends to get made in the colon on a high meat diet called PCAH, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. 
Okay, number 14, reason why meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. You also tend to accumulate N-nitrosal compounds in the colon which are associated with increased risk of cancer. Okay, got to go to the next slide. Okay, um, reason number 15 why a high meat diet, the typical westernized diet, is associated with increased risk of cancer. Sodium in salt is very often used to flavor meat or to preserve the meat. Sodium is a vasoconstrictor. It inhibits the production of endothelial cell, arterial lining cell, nitric oxide. This leads to vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction leads to, um, you'll get hypertension, you'll get atherosclerosis, this leads to hypoxia of the tissues. Anything that decreases oxygen supply to the tissues increases the risk of cancer. Otto Warburg showed that just by decreasing the oxygen supply to cells, he could induce them to become cancerous. So hypoxia is bad. All right, number 16. In meat, there's, like we said, they're often in association with high sodium, but the thing about meat foods, they tend to be low in potassium and magnesium. Potassium and magnesium, which are common in plant foods, but low in meat um, and processed foods, are vasodilators. They're like the opposite of sodium as, as regards to this. And because you lose your vasodilators, your arteries become constricted. So instead of being wide open, I'm trying to get in front of the camera, already, they become constricted, decreases blood supply to the tissues, more hypoxia, increased risk of cancer. Okay, number 17. Um, high meat diet is associated with decreased DNA repair uh, system function. And I, it's another thing I learned from T. Colin Campbell, author of the China Study and whole expert on He's the number one expert in the world on protein and its relationship to cancer. Number 18, meat is associated with decreased function of the immune system with regard to the NK cells, again per T. Colin Campbell. Okay, number 19, meat anabolics such as estrogens. Um, the meat cattle, for example, they're often given estrogen compounds, sometimes multiple estrogen compounds to accelerate growth. High estrogen levels in the blood induce a person to gain weight. So they can induce an animal to gain weight. You know, cattle farms, you know, CAFO is those cattle operations to rapidly feed them, they will give them estrogen to make them grow fast so that they then can use them for beef sooner. Okay, concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFO. They um, will give them estrogens and then that estrogen is still in the animal, some of it, uh, when we eat it. And so we eat more estrogens. Estrogens activate something called the PPAR gamma switch and that confuses our brain, makes us think that our body's pregnant, if you will, and it needs to gain weight to save weight in case the, bobby, the, the baby, the future quote-unquote baby, will need that nutrition. Okay, um, so that's called the PPAR gamma fat switch, and that's also associated with the hypothalamus, arcuate nucleus, hunger center, if you will, for gaining weight in the brain. Um, okay, number 20. Meat is high in fat, and it's typically you know, around 40 to 50 percent fat. Even the leanest meats, at the leanest you'll get, would be about 25 percent fat. So that's really fat. A typical low-fat vegan diet is 80-10-10, 80 percent carbohydrate, 10 percent protein, and 10 percent fat. So, you know, just eating a regular piece of meat, you're typically eating something that's 40 to 50 percent fat. That's extraordinarily high, and that's why most meat eaters are overweight, um, you know, especially as they get older. All right, so obesity is associated with increased estrogen levels. When a person's fat, their, their fat tissue makes estrogen. Anything estrogen causes cells to proliferate in the breast, in the uterus, and in the male prostate. The male prostate is sort of like the male equivalent of the uterus. So it increases cancer. Higher estrogen levels increase cancer in the breast, the endometrium of the uterus, and in the prostate. Okay, so you don't want that. Okay, in addition, uh, having more obesity, besides making more estrogen, you also lower the transport protein in the blood, the steroid hormone binding globulin, SHBG, and that also increases the activity of the estrogen in the body. Okay, number 21. Cows are engineered to be pregnant while they're making their milk. They're making milk while they're pregnant, and this means that they have higher estrogen levels. A pregnant animal has higher estrogen levels, okay? Remember, think about birth control pills. Typical one is EE2, with final estradiol. So the point of that is the high estrogens signaling pregnancy so the person doesn't ovulate. And you're now drinking uh, a milk, a substance with high estrogens. Okay, let's say you're drinking whole milk, for example. Um, 
associated with increased risk of cancer, breast endometrium, prostate. Okay, and then I made 22 sort of a separate one. Milk is associated with increased risk of prostate cancer. Okay, um, number 23, reason why meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. Uh, we talked about fiber preventing leaky gut and how fiber reduces the risk of colon cancer. And the big thing that the, the good bacteria do is they produce short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. And butyrate in particular is used for over two thirds of the energy of the colonocytes. And when you decrease that amount, um, the colonocytes don't function as well and they're at increased risk for cancer. That's thought to be another association. Okay, number 24, meat has high heme iron. Okay, heme iron is absorbed in much higher amounts than is plant iron. And eventually, it takes decades, but a person will tend to develop something I call iron overload um, syndrome. And they are at increased risk to have high blood levels of ferritin, especially if cells die in their liver from fatty liver, for example, or other reasons and they'll, they'll get higher free floating iron in the blood. Iron is very useful because it has a variable valence. And let's say it's most commonly Fe2 plus and it's often Fe3 plus. It can even be other valences. That's why it's called a transitional metal because it has a variable valence. And it, in the blood, when it's free in the presence of oxygen, it can start cycling between Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus, Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus. And that can lead to the production of uh, free radical oxygens, reactive oxygen species, are often abbreviated ROS. And there's a great paper on that called Iron Behaving Badly by Douglas Kell, PhD from England. It's actually like a genius level paper. And so you don't want iron free in your blood. Iron is something like, it's useful where you need it, but if you got it where you don't need it, it can cause all kinds of problems. Start catalyzing uh, the production of free radicals that are like super balls bouncing around breaking things. Um, and they're thought to increase oxidative stress in a significant way and increase the risk of cancer. Excuse me. Okay, number 25. Um, meat having more heme iron and potentially eventually leading to iron overload syndrome. Uh, the problem with that too is iron itself when present in the blood or free in a cell, it's supposed to always be bound to something, virtually almost always. It can facilitate the transfer of iron to cancer cells, for example. In order to grow, like I said, it's a good way to think of cancer as like a de-differentiated cell becoming like an anaerobic bacteria. In order to replicate, it needs iron, okay? So if normally the body prevents bacteria from growing and also can help minimize cancer growth by making iron not available free in the blood. But when there's more free iron available, that also helps cancer to grow. Um, viruses, there's some viruses in meat. That's not really proven that I'm aware of and they're thought to potentially increase the risk of cancer. So that's a potential consideration. You know, that's the old sort of joke. You don't, you're not gonna get a direct disease, infectious disease as likely from a plant source as you are from, yeah, I know sometimes plant can be contaminated with feces, et cetera, but I'm saying in general, <clears throat> an animal can get a disease that you might get as well. Our metabolism is relatively similar to a lot of mammals. It is quite different in comparison, relatively speaking, with plants. Okay, number 27, oh, the constipation again. When a person's constipated, chronic constipation, uh, I talked about this in a lecture recently, I think it was the Burkitt lecture and the abdominal pressure syndrome lectures from earlier. You're chronically constipated, you're straining at the stool to defecate and that causes the valsalva numerous when you tighten your gut to, to try to push the poop out and that can have your esophagus pop into the chest. This is a very common thing, it's called hiatal hernia. And once the, the esophagus is partly in the chest, you get reflux of gastric acid up there, and that chronic irritation from the acid into the lower esophagus causes something called Barrett's esophagus, which is an inflamed esophagus. The cells start to change. That's called metaplasia, and that is at increased risk for cancer formation. You know, back in the 1980s, the most common cause of esophageal cancer was smoker-drinker cancer. That's what we always called it for squamous cell carcinoma. But nowadays, the most common form is adenocarcinoma because so many people are fat and constipated from eating a high meat, high oil, junk food diet. And they got hiatal hernias, gastroesophageal reflux, GERD is typically abbreviated, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And um, so that's another way that meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. Okay, number 27. Um, the salt that we spoke about earlier being used to preserve and flavor meats, typically sodium chloride. The chloride is a negatively charged ion, an anion, 
And the body has to balance all its, its ions, anions and cations, positive and negative ions, because it has to maintain its osmotic um, equilibrium. If you have too much ions outside of the cells, you know, water from the cell will pass across the plasma membrane into the extracellular matrix in the blood and the cells will become dehydrated and vice versa if there was too much ions inside the cell. And so because of that, when one ion goes up, there'll be some compensatory ion that goes down. And when you increase chloride more and more, the body um, excretes some of its bicarbonate. The bicarbonate is a pH buffer. So if you're losing your pH buffer, that will induce a low-grade metabolic acidosis. Acidosis favors cancer growth. So that's another reason to limit your uh, sodium intake. Uh, people that eat in a westernized diet eat far too much sodium. Saltless populations that live out in rural areas that don't add any salt to their food eat about 200 milligrams a day, 200 to 500 at the most, whereas Westerners are often eating you know, 5,000 milligrams a day, way, way more salt. We're talking more than 10 times more than what we're designed to eat. Even the low salt diet, some people call 2,000 milligrams a day as a low salt diet, is 10 times more than what an indigenous population will be eating. Okay, number 28 reason why meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. Meat has a different amino acid composition. Proteins are basically a bunch of amino acids strung together like a string of beads. And um, meat has a different amino acid composition. It has a lot more methionine and cysteine. Part, these are sulfur-containing amino acids. And in their metabolic degradation, some sulfuric acid is made. This sulfuric acid uh, induces a low-grade metabolic acidosis. Low-grade metabolic acidosis favors cancer growth. Number 29 reason why meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. Methionine is an essential amino acid. Cancer needs methionine to grow, okay? It's not an amino acid. Essential means that the body cannot make that amino acid. Methionine is present in higher amounts in meat, so cancer needs that to grow. So the more methionine available, that helps the cancer to be able to grow. Okay, and that might be one of the reasons why some people think a low protein diet is beneficial, especially no animal protein. And again, the animal protein is quite different than the plant protein because there's more methionine, more cysteine, and more leucine. Those are the three main things that are typically mentioned. Some people also say lysine increases uh, cholesterol levels. So maybe those four amino acids in particular often come up in conversations discussing the differences between meat uh, protein and animal protein. Okay, the next thing is, um, and that's kind of one of the other jokes, is that you'll talk to a person who doesn't know much in nutrition, but they'll have vaguely heard somewhere, oh, I heard meat protein's better. <laughs> yeah, right, it's better for increasing your risk of cancer. Okay, number 30, meat increases the risk of inflammatory bowel disease. And that's thought to be an autoimmune disease, and inflammatory bowel diseases, like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, are associated with increased risk of intestinal tract cancer. Okay, number 31, uh, the meat having increased choline might be a risk factor for uh, prostate cancer, okay? Oh, and by the way, there's a book called Proteinaholic uh, written by Garth Davis, physician. It's a very good book. He's a bariatric surgeon, and he knows a lot, and he decided to really try to understand nutrition, and I thought he, he wrote a great book with that. Okay, now we're getting into something a little more complicated, but we'll just go through it fast. Beef and dairy, they, they've got increased amount of a sialic acid called NU5GC. And NU5GC means neuraminic acid, uh, and the 5GC is a form that's only present in these animals, not normally in humans, but it only differs from, you know, the human ones like NU5AC. It only differs by like a hydrogen group such that the cells of the intestinal tract will actually incorporate this sialic acid uh, into their tissues and other cells, but the problem is the immune system recognizes uh, new 5GC as being different than new 5AC, and it will thus um, elicit an immune response and cause systemic inflammation. That systemic inflammation is called xenosialitis, xenoforin sialitis from the sialic acid. Sialic acid is, I, I drew a picture of this in my last lecture on atherosclerosis, but it's basically very similar. Just think of glucose with a carboxylic acid on it. There's a little more to it than that, but that's basically the gist of it. So anyway, xenosialitis, inflammation from eating meat is another reason why meat causes increased systemic inflammation, and it'll also increase CRP, C-reactive protein in the blood. That's a little tricky, though, C-reactive protein. I'll talk about that in an atherosclerosis level. 
there's some controversy about whether C-reactive protein small elevations, as detected with high sensitivity CRP tests, um, truly are inflammation. They could also be an indicator uh, released from the muscle, a myokine from the muscle signal indicating that the muscle is not able to maintain its glycogen stores because of the fat-induced rouleau formation, okay? But that's another topic for another time. Uh, number 33, reason why meat is associated with uh, increased risk of cancer. The high-protein diets are associated with more of a bacterial infection in the stomach called Helicobacter pylori, and Helicobacter pylori is associated with increased risk of gastric carcinoma. High sodium is also associated with increased risk of gastric carcinoma. So if you're eating a lot of meat with a lot of salt, you're increasing your risk of uh, stomach cancer. Gastric carcinoma, same thing, stomach cancer. Okay, um, total meat, red meat, processed meat, they're all associated with increased risk of uh, carcinoma. Non-organic meat, especially is higher in herbicides, um, let's say than organic meat or you know, grass-fed meat, so to speak. So that's another reason why there's increased risk of cancer. Okay, and that's all the slides. So there we had quite a few, over 30 reasons why meat is associated with increased risk of cancer. And, you know, as T. Colin Campbell, the world uh, protein expert, said the, that casein and the proteins in milk are the strongest carcinogen in all the world, stronger than everything else that he's aware of that's been tested, and he's been studying it for 50 years. Okay, and, you know, everything I've read about uh, animal foods and meat suggest numerous ways, okay? So um, these are other reasons that if you want to reduce your risk of getting cancer or cancer accelerating its growth, it's good to reduce your intake of meat. Okay, that's it.